Hello, hello. I think I'll go ahead and get started. It'll be looks nice and informal since I know half of you in the room. <laughs> uh, so my name is Mark Wong. I'm a consultant with Second Quadrant. I uh, contribute to the Postgres project. Talk a little bit today about how the 9.6 uh, branch is looking in terms of performance. I'll uh, look at, well, go over very briefly what the tests are, talk about some of the patches coming into 9.6, um, talk a little bit about some mainframes, Postgres, Excel, some column-oriented databases, and uh, uh, some replication. So throughout most of these, these uh, uh, evaluations, we're looking at PG Bench. If you're already familiar with uh, Postgres, you're probably familiar with PG Bench, a TPCB derivative online transaction type, basic online transaction type workload doing batch processing, uh, a open source kit called DBT2, which is just another TPCC derivative, another OLTP type workload. And then uh, DBT3 is a TPCH decision, decision support type workload. And then some various small custom type tests to illustrate uh, specific parts of, of uh, the changes coming in, depending on what the patch is. So first off, where is 9.6 now? Um, ran a PG Bench read-only test on uh, a four-way, eight-core, 32-thread system just to see what the scalability was looking like. So um, this won't be particularly interesting, but it should be at least uh, not, um, uh, it should be at least encouraging that to see that the performance hasn't, uh, the scalability hasn't degraded with uh, uh, 9.6 yet compared to uh, the 9.5 release. Although um, in this particular chart, the doing a, a read-only test with prepared statements is showing a little bit of, of regression when you're getting um, towards a higher number of clients. Uh, don't have any answers for that yet, but, but uh, I think, um, I think Thomas Wandra is, is trying to figure that out to get more details on what's going on. So that's what's in the true now. Uh, some of the patches um, highlighting in for this presentation. Um, there's a freeze avoidance patch, atomic pinning and unpinning of buffers in the buffer management code. A uh, little bit about parallel sequential scans, uh, unique joins, fixed decimal data types, and uh, shared aggregate states. A couple of these have been committed, some have been uh, submitted, and one extension. So who has really large tables that uh, don't change very much? Um, do you find it painful when uh, uh, vacuuming or uh, uh, after running a lot of deletes or updates on those large tables? So this, this patch, this freeze avoidance patch is authored by uh, Sawada Matsuhiko. Um, it, it's, it makes a table read only and the benefits for this is that then certain DML statements can be ignored and then uh, maybe more importantly, depending on what you're doing, uh, vacuuming is, is ignored. Um, the auto vacuum process won't come along and try to figure out if uh, it needs to do any freezing in a table because it would already know that, that it didn't need to be done now that it's marked read only. So with this patch, there's a couple of, of uh, extra DDL commands just to mark it read-only, read-write. The uh, atomic pinning and unpinning of buffers in the buffer manager is authored by uh, Yuri, I don't know if there's anyone uh, help me pronounce my names here, uh, 
Yuri Zerlev. Zerlev. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I need to practice my other languages. Um, so, so this is intended to improve the read scalability uh, by using atomic operations instead of the spin locks that are currently in place. Uh, the the testing um, that he that he had done with this was on a uh, uh, Power 8 system, four nodes, eight processors, eight cores, eight threads. Uh, and the chart of the results here is um, against a a uh, I think they call them LPARs, 256 logical processors for this particular system. So looking at it from the uh, bottom up, as I imagine that text may be hard to read. Uh, the very bottom number is actually results uh, with 9.4. This is uh, another PG bench test. Uh, so 9.4 on the very bottom. Next line up is 9.5, the 9.5 release, which which is uh, nice to see a, a improvement there. The third line, next line up from that is the head of the 9.6 branch. So again, nice to see a little bit of an improvement compared to 9.5 thus far already. And then the um, five lines above that are various aspects of implementing uh, these atomic operations in, and pulling out some of these spin locks. So compared to 9.5, the or what's even in 9.6 in now, the throughput is uh, looks like it's increasing two to four times as much uh, at various parts of, of uh, the number of clients that are, are running in the system, the, the amount of concurrency that's, that's going on. So uh, this looks pretty encouraging to see drastic performance in, in these kind of workloads. Who's excited for parallelism? So uh, a parallel uh, sequential scan has gone in, authored by Amit Coppola. Uh, this also involves some additional work of assessing parallel safety from Robert Haas. And what this patch, what this work did was improve the um, sequential table scan performance when select queries are, are retrieving a um, relatively small number of rows compared to how many rows are in the table. So it introduces a new uh, configuration parameter to set the number to uh, limit your degree of parallelism so you don't accidentally uh, uh, overwork your system. Some limitations uh, so far is that it's only for select statements and it doesn't handle joins yet. So what I wanted to show was uh, uh, a few more few more data points to what Harry Babu had shown on the mailing list. Um, what I'm going to do is run select uh, some select queries on a on a single table and show the behavior of the degree of parallelism and um, uh, selectivity of the rows coming back. So just to quickly illustrate, this table has about 16 columns, a variety of integer, uh, floating point, uh, date, and, and uh, far chart columns. And the query is pretty simple. We're just selecting one of the columns. We'll control the selectivity by uh, using a modulo on one of the key columns so we can pretty much uh, uh, guarantee that the percent of rows that will be coming back. Um, and just to quickly mention, it's a chord system, 16 thread Intel system. And this is what it looks like. So the, I think what is important to understand with, with this parallelism is that um, it is important to control the, the degree of parallelism that's going on. The red line up there on the top is, 
is uh, what happens when you're selecting all the rows from the table. Um, that first point on the left is single user, single thread, single process, sorry. Um, selecting all the rows from the table. And um, if you're selecting all the rows, if you increase your degree of parallelism and want two processors to go after it, you're going to more than double the amount of time it takes to scan that table. That green line in the middle uh, is, is selecting only a quarter of the rows back, increasing the number of processes scanning through that table from, from one to two uh, already will improve your uh, uh, response time by about 25%. But then um, increasing the degree of parallelism after that is you start to uh, not look so good anymore. Yes? So is that all in memory or aren't you going to have mm. Yeah, so the question is, is if the, all of this data is in uh, memory. So on, the, on this particular system, 64 gigs of uh, RAM, the data set of the entire database is uh, 100 gigabytes. So this particular table is going to be about um, somewhere between 80 and 70 and 80 gigabytes. Oh, the uh, question was how many shared buffers, or how, how big the shared buffers were set to. Um, I actually don't recall, but if I were to guess, I had probably set them to eight gigabytes. Um, yeah, and then, and then that blue line on the bottom is, is just reducing the selectivity in half again, selecting 12% um, of the rows back. Uh, in this particular case, moving between or increasing the, the number of processes um, between two and four seems to improve the response time by, uh, uh, by almost having it down another 40%. But again, you have too many processes scanning that table, your uh, response times are going to start to increase. So, um, uh, Making sure that that degree of, of parallelism is is limited appropriately, and um, this set I think I, I uh, glossed over this part. The set tuple com cost is is basically the uh, parameter that the planner uses to determine at what point should it not use uh, a parallel sequential scan. The next patch is deals with unique joins, offer, authored by David Rowley. The purpose of this is to improve the join performance when the inner side of a join is known to be unique by either a unique index, a group by clause, or a distinct clause. So Thomas Vondra did some uh, experiments. He uh, uh, created a simple test where he used uh, two tables um, to simulate sort of a uh, fact, dimension, relationship, star schema type thing. And um, he wanted to illustrate how well this patch performed when he had 10 more factors and dimension tables at various, um, various scales. So pretty simple. Uh, Table with with a dimension table with an integer key and then a, a fact table with another integer key. The uh, query was pretty simple, just to select a count one um, when uh, uh, selecting all the rows uh, joined between these two tables. And this is what he found. So when he had um, a hundred thousand rows in the dimension table, then one million in the fact table. The before and after change was 7%. Um, as when he grew it, the dimension table to 1 million rows, thus having 10 million rows on the fact table, uh, the joint performance improved by 17%. And then um, uh, somewhere between that and having 10 million dimension rows, 100 million factor rows, the, the improvement came back down to about 10%. A, another 
um, extension creates this fixed decimal data type. How many folks deal with, with numerics? Find them slow, fast enough, so-so? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So David Rowley also created an extension to add this fixed decimal data type. Um, the purpose of this was to help improve the performance of queries that were aggregating large number of rows of, of numeric type data. Uh, the way this was implemented was by using 64-bit integers to provide a predefined precision decimal, um, which I think was was two uh, places. Oh, I'm starting to forget my math terms. Um, so, so similar to a numeric uh, in in trying to be a precision decimal type, but at the same time, um, because of of the fixed decimal type. You do have to. You may have to be aware that precision is truncated as opposed to rounded. And um, just to illustrate in that same table I showed earlier, uh, you have a a, uh, a table even with out of 16 columns. Um, if if four of them were numerics, let's say we use the uh, fixed data, fixed decimal data type, and um, see how uh, our ad hoc decision support queries run in, in a TPCH, we see four of the queries have fairly significant improvement um, in ranging from 35% from, uh, to 55% uh, uh, improved response times. So the, to give you an idea of, of what these types of queries look like. Um, query one, which was on the on the far left over here, um, is basically aggregating uh, those four rows in slightly various ways, uh, summing them together, taking averages, and grouping them by a uh, a couple of other uh, statuses: the, whether the the order w was returned and and whether this. Um, where in the ordering process these uh, light items were at. So, so this query is trying to, to determine the amount of business that was billed, shipped, and returned. And um, in the same, with, with uh, the scale factor of, of 100 gigabytes, we're already seeing um, this much improvement on a table that's between 70 and, and 80 gigabytes. All right, so how many people have considered column stores, column more in databases? Uh, are you still trying to decide whether you want to stick with one or the other using both? So for, for those who haven't really considered it, just to mention, uh, I think, a few popular use cases is uh, column more in databases are, are, um, can be good. Uh, good solutions for data warehousing, an ad hoc query system, or just computing aggregates over large volumes of data. So once again, using the TPCH workload, what we want to do is uh, take a look at how Postgres compares to what some of these column stores can do, see uh, how much room there is to gain um, so there, so I took a look at a couple of open source column oriented databases, which uh, I hope you won't mind that I anonymize to uh, CS1 and CS2. But here's what some of the things look like. So there, there uh, is a load test as part of the TPCH. Um, we're looking at 100 gigabytes of data. The this 100 gigabytes is spread across eight tables, and for Postgres, uh, the load test also takes into consideration how long it takes to build all the indexes you want to have, so in, in this case, we're building 34 indexes. For the column stores, um, we don't need to necessarily build indexes, but uh, they, they do 
some of these do support indexes, but for uh, my initial look, I, I didn't uh, look into indexing the data. So, um, load time is pretty impressive. To load 100 gigabytes of data and build your indexes for it so you can run some queries against it takes about uh, nine hours for Postgres. But these column store databases can, can slurp up that, that uh, 100 gigabytes of data um, in one case in just over an hour, the other one in, in three and a half hours-ish. And um, it'll also be interesting to point out here that in, with the load test with Postgres, we are loading the tables in parallel and um, building indexes uh, in parallel across the tables to get it down to nine hours. At the same time, it, it was also interesting to find that these particular open source column store databases um, actually could not load, or one of them, one of them could not load data in parallel. And it happens to be the one that loaded the, the data the fastest. You only could load one, one table at a time. Now at the power test, the power test in this workload is a series of 22 queries uh, run consecutively. And the point, the purpose is to see how fast you can power through all of those queries. So the, the way that it's scored is a weighted geometric mean of all the response times. Now, higher number is better. You can see here that Postgres almost gets 4,000, whereas uh, uh, one of these column stores gets over 8,000 in the score uh, or, and, and uh, even over 7,000. So one way to interpret these test results is that these column stores are, are able to crunch through these decision support ad hoc queries twice as fast, twice as much as, as Postgres. So a lot of room to gain. Seems like there's a lot of room to gain if to add uh, uh, or a, a large gap that could be closed by having a column store data type in Postgres. Um, this is just to illustrate the response times of each of the queries. The uh, Postgres results are the blue ones on the right, but um, it is kind of interesting to note that to see where, which queries uh, Postgres or the column stores actually do much better than Postgres does. Some of them, I mean, even the column stores are not too consistent. One of the column stores happens to run certain types of queries better than the other one. But um, still, across the board, to be able to crunch through twice as many, twice as many queries with a column store than you can with Postgres. Um, and just to give a couple of examples of where these, the types of questions that these column stores seem to answer better than, than Postgres, um, if you were looking to uh, look at what your top 10 unshipped orders with the uh, highest revenue, or revenue to be realized. Uh, listing the revenue volumes of your local suppliers and identifying customers that have been um, having problems and having problems being defined as uh, which customers have been returning your product more than others. So anyone use the mainframe? No? Any mainframe users? Anyone who thought about it? No? <laughs> All right, so maybe, maybe this will be interesting. Or, or is, is, there, is everyone, uh, anyone anti-mainframes? No? Okay, that's good. That's good. So took a look at some of the latest uh, mainframe offering from IBM, their Z13. We ran some OLTP, type, uh, TPCC, take a look at an OLTP workload on how this thing does. And we wanted to see how it did to a popular competitor, uh, if you don't mind me anonymizing that also. Uh, although these tests were, were run against the, the uh, 9.4 release at the time, I, I think these numbers are still actually quite interesting to look at because they certainly wouldn't have gotten any worse. So a couple basic hardware details. Uh, these the Z13 processor 
has a 5 gigahertz clock speed. There are eight cores per die, uh, 16 threads, um, 64 gigs of RAM in this particular uh, uh, LPAR. Um, so we tried to match it up against something similar, a eight core uh, processor that also had 16 threads, 2.4 gigahertz clock speed, again, 64 gigabytes of RAM. And this is what we found. So running an in-memory OLTP workload, uh, the lines here are illustrating the uh, performance of the processors with hyper-threading turned on uh, or not. Um, so the very bottom one is our uh, popular competitor with no hyper-threading. Next one up is the same system with hyper-threading turned on. And then um, the, the top two number, top two lines uh, are the, the mainframe results. So what we see here is that with or without hyper-threading, that the uh, throughput of an OLTP workload seems to run twice as fast on a mainframe. Uh, but then we, you know, want to see some writes go on, and uh, this this particular test is using PG Bench. Oh, I think I said, sorry, I said this was a TPCC earlier, um, but this is this is a PG Bench um, workload. Uh, PG Bench again with a with a write workload, write only workload. Um, on the popular competitor, the results with the hyperthreading turned on and off didn't seem to make much of a difference. The lines are pretty much on top of each other on the bottom. But on the mainframe, uh, there is a substantial difference of, of having the hyperthreading turned on even for uh, a write-only workload. And once again, the, the ability to, to do a, a heavy write workload on the mainframe, was we were able to push through twice the throughput. Now this one is, is uh, DBT2, the TPCC derivative. Um, what these lines are showing uh, is uh, as you scale up the um, size of the database that the throughput of the, of the tests are staying pretty consistent. Um, this particular workload, the mainframe seems to maintain about a 1.7 times throughput. Um, I will not repeat that question, but it's yes. Is it another or is it oh, it's another type of system. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so uh, uh, hypothetically, it's it's a different hardware vendor that may be going up against IBM. That that. Uh, okay. And you're basing on Postgres on both of these, and looking at the comparison. Yes, yes. So we're running po uh, Postgres on uh, the same way on two different types of hardware. Ah, uh, okay. I kept seeing competitor. I'm like, I'm trying to figure out what competitor might be for Oracle. Oh, yes. Sorry. Sorry. So. Yeah, so one, one, fork, one fork of Postgres versus another fork of Postgres. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, uh, um, uh, sorry for being facetious. It's the same, same Postgres. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I, I won't say that because of this, but. <laughs> All right, so yeah, yeah. If, if uh, well, didn't seem like anyone was, was uh, interested in mainframes uh, in the room today, but but uh, there are some interesting pieces of hardware. Yes. Um, the question is what the sticker price was on the Z13. Um, I'm afraid that uh, I got, never got to see a price sheet. But I don't think uh, any of those IBM sales folks will shy away from letting you know how much they cost. <laughs> All right, so next up, Postgres XL. How many folks uh, have, have looked at Postgres XE XL over the years? Anyone using it now? Uh, hoping to be able to use it? So hopefully, hopefully some of these test, test results will, will uh, keep you interested then. 
So for, for those of you who aren't familiar, Postgres XL is a uh, fork of Postgres. Uh, they <laughs> a lot of these a lot of the people involved were previously involved with Postgres XC and, and uh, Stato Stato either one Stato. Um, it is an all-purpose, fully acid, open-source scale-out database solution, and uh, it's been rebased against 9.5 recently. So previously, it was a, against the the Postgres 9.2 uh, branch. To give you an idea that after a few releases, there may be a lot more interesting things to be able to do with with Excel. So just to quickly mention that that I did a little comparison on um, on AWS systems, uh, EC2 using setting this up on some EC2 instances. Uh, these individual instances had 32. Uh, am I reading? Oh, okay. Uh, this this one is is just core Postgres. At at the time, uh, the 9.5 Alpha 2 was was the uh, uh, what was currently available, and um, this this single instance, 32 virtual CPUs, 244 gigabytes of RAM, eight uh, SSD drives in it. Uh, then for the Postgres XL cluster, put together something with with similar uh, resources. So we have eight nodes. Um, each of these nodes have. Oh, I got to do this math in my head. I think I. S yeah. So, so each of these nodes had four CPUs. Um, uh, what is an eighth of 244? 30-ish, 30 gigabytes of memory. Yeah. So four <coughs> CPUs in in each of these nodes, 30 gigabytes of memory, um, and then uh, I think these little ones had only one SSD attached to them. So this is what we saw on load test uh, again using the DBT3, a the TPCH derivative, to load 100 gigabytes of data, build 34 indexes, took about two hours on the with Postgres 9.5 on the single instance. In the eight node cluster, splitting up those data files uh, eight ways, um, only took. 44 minutes to load all that data and build build those 34 indexes, cutting down that load time in half. And uh, while we haven't explored it, it the the Postgres XL developers have reason to believe that if we spent more time in determining how many uh, coordinator nodes that we had per data node, um, we may be able to to improve this load time even further. And also to take extra care in sorting your data files so that uh, e the data that you're loading in the table all streams over to one node. Oh, got my slides out of order here. Sorry. So this is where the individual node details. Now this this slide illustrates how. The response times, how much of the response have to have improved on each of the individual queries of the power test between 9.5 and and uh, scaling out on Excel. Um, almost almost across the board, there's pretty significant improvement in the response time. If we're looking at the score values, uh, scoring 2,400. About 2,400 with 9.5, and then scoring about almost 6,300 with Postgres XL. Almost 160% improvement in its processing power. So hopefully, we'll we'll see good things that come from Postgres XL, and it won't be a fork forever. Now, how many folks? Uh, have replication in there, in there, uh, using replication. Um, streaming, replication, Sloney, Londis, uh, more than one, or do you got, or 
<coughs> sorry. Yeah. Uh, so we're we're gonna take a look at PG Logical is a extension that is um, newly available for that can be used with uh, 9.4 and and newer versions of Postgres. Uh, Thomas Vondra took a look at seeing how well these how well each of these uh, replication solutions worked with with PG Bench on a uh, read-only workload. Um, just to give you an idea of the of the system size, of there there are a pair of of two 80 WS instances with four SSD drives attached and 122 gigabytes of RAM. So most of these tests are are probably going to be end, ending up uh, in memory. Um, just to illustrate or to uh, show a little bit of, of tuning that's gone on, these or that these weren't default parameters. Increase the checkpoint time out to 15 minutes. Um, Set the I effective I/O concurrency to 32, one gigabyte of, of maintenance work memory. Setting the max wall size to eight gigabytes and, and um, configuring 16 gigabytes of shared buffers. And this is what we get. So in this two-node setup, uh, the the two lines that are are overlapping for the most part on the bottom are the are the throughput numbers from Londeast and Sloney. At the top end, which I guess in some ways would be considered, uh, well, I, I guess the uh, uh, peak of what you could expect out of a replication, replication solution is um, the streaming replication. So that, that uh, huge difference from having those trigger-based Replication solutions. Do you, do you guys using them find that to be a, a burden sometimes? The performance of of Sony or Lundy. So now the the line in the middle uh, is the performance of the throughput that you can get with PG Logical, which is not using triggers the same way that that uh, Lundy and Sony are building off of the. Uh, streaming web replication facilities inside inside Postgres. Yep. So, this transaction comes back in this on the master? The question is whether these numbers are, are coming from the master of the slave system. Um, I actually don't know. I, I guess I would have assumed the master. But, well, because you, you have to run, it must be from the master be based on you have to run PG Bench against the master and these numbers are probably coming out of the PG bench. So you're telling me that because this is high clientele, that the actual creation of the logical payload is enough to cause thirty Yeah, so it's looking like like streaming. If if uh, streaming replication was the right solution for you, you you're getting um, what six times the throughput compared to one day of Sony PG Logical. Uh, it's not quite that high, but you're still getting three, four times the the throughput. And that's all I had for you today. Thank you for listening.